<laughs> it's so good to see you. I'm Josh, one of the ministers here at Clear Creek. If you're a guest, we are so glad that you're here. I'd love it to just have a chance to say howdy to you after a gathering. So I'll be out in the lobby here as will some of our other ministers and leaders. We'd love just to say hi. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're still trying to connect, maybe you want to kick the tires of the church or of faith, there's a next step table out in the lobby where we would love to help you learn more about our church, step into community. Uh, but again, just so glad that you're with us here in person and those of you joining us online. It's just good to be together today. Today we are continuing a series called The Disappearing Church, where we're headed and God's plan to turn it around. Where we're headed and God's plan to turn it around. Now, as I told you last week, this series is based on a book that came out in 2013 called The Great Evangelical Recession, Six Factors That Will Crash the American Church as We Know It and How to Prepare. Yippee! As I said last week, folks, we are not a gloom and doom church. If you've been here for more than a week, you know that we are not predicting the end of the world or the end of the church. Rather, we are simply seeing trends that are somewhat troubling, but we believe that God is bigger than the typical trends of this nation and that God has a plan to turn it around. We simply want to be wise enough to see what is happening so we may be prepared to step into the future that he has prepared for us. Because as we said at the beginning of this year, at the beginning of this year, we believe God has land prepared for you individually and we corporately to take. You say land, what do you mean, what do you mean? I mean there are places and spaces in our city and around our world that God is calling us to be the light of the world, to step into and be brokers of peace, to help families be reunited, to bring the hope of Jesus and to see God's kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what I mean. But to do that, we need to first assess and know where we are today. Because how many of us know that if you want to get your financial house in order, you first need to know where are your finances right now? I know so many of you are helping people. You know where they are and, and you're helping them. But you know the very first step is you've got to know what the financial situation is first before you can grow to a healthier financial place. Same with your physical health, right? If you want to become healthier in 2021, you first have to know where your baseline health is right now. For instance, if your cabinet is full of Twinkies, that might be an indicator of where you are, but you might have to change some things to get where you want to go. Likewise, God's church, we believe, is a beautiful gift that we are the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and God has big plans for us, but we need to know where we are to know how best to move forward. Amen? Amen? Okay, so here's where we're going to go this morning. I'm just going to go ahead and cut to the chase. Here's the bottom line. Before I put anything up on screen, before I tell you anything else, I want you to hear this. Stick with me. We got to go through some bad news first, but we're going to get to some good news. And some of the news that you're going to hear today is simply this. We're going to have to learn how to do ministry more creatively to fulfill the purpose that God has for us. Are you with me? We're going to have to learn how to do ministry more creatively to do what God is calling us into. You say, wait a minute, what does that mean? It's all good. It's all good. You ready? Let's get into this. If you missed last week, we are looking at four of the six factors that Dickerson outlines in his book. We're using a lot of his content, just looking at it through the lens of Clear Creek. And if you missed it last week, we said the first factor of the American church, the big issue, the first one is this, that the evangelical church, by the way, that word evangelical, it refers to people who believe the core truths of scripture. We're not talking things that maybe be that divisive, but basic things. An evangelical is someone who believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He is the only way to God. Evangelicals believe that the Bible, all 66 books, are God-breathed, God-inspired, and authoritative for our lives. We don't get to pick and choose what we like and don't like. Evangelicals also believe that salvation is through Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone. We are saved because of Jesus Christ. That's evangelical. So we're not talking about people who are wildly different. Rather, the evangelical church in the United States, we said, is much smaller than we've been told. You say, well, are we 80% of the national population? Nope, not 80%. Well, okay, we're 40% of the national population, right, Josh? Nope, not even that. We are, as we said last week, between 7 and 9% of the national population, people who believe these core truths. We're a small percentage, not as big as we thought. That's the first factor. And today, again, we're gonna talk about how to move forward, but gotta deal with the bad stuff first. The second factor that Dickerson points out is this one. 
unless generational patterns change radically, many ministries will see revenue decrease by 50 to 70% in the next 10 to 30 years. Many ministries will see radical ministry decrease by 50 to 70% in the next 10 to 30 years. You say, what does that mean? Okay, let's just do a real quick thing here. Uh, how many of you, raise your hand, if your family has a budget? Any of you have a family budget? Go ahead, let's see some hands. Uh, uh, okay, so the next sermon series is going to be about finances, I think. We need to start. Okay, okay. You should have a budget. Budgets are good. They give you freedom because you know what you have. Okay, imagine that your family budget, tomorrow morning, you wake up, and tomorrow morning, your family budget was cut in half or 70%. How would that affect what your family did, ate, wore, lived, how would it affect your family if 50 to 70% of your family's budget disappeared tomorrow? It would radically change your family's way of operating, would it not? Studies are showing that over the next 10 to 30 years, 50 to 70% of the annual giving across the nation to churches, evangelical churches, and parachurch organizations will drop by 50 to 70%. This is a major factor that will impact the way that the American church, key phrase, the American church does ministry. You say, why, why, what's going on here? Let me give you three reasons why we will see this happen over the next 10 to 30 years. Reason number one, if you're writing this down, reason number one is that the generous generation, that's the 70 plus year olds, by the way, they give almost 50% of everything that goes to the church. That's incredible. This generous generation began passing away about 10 years ago. 70 plus years old and older began passing away 10 years ago. And according to the research, Nearly 10, excuse me, nearly 1,000 of them are called home to heaven every day. Over the next few years, the faithful and reliable generation will pass away. As they do, total giving nationally will decrease by as much as half for typical evangelical ministries. According to the state of the church giving through 2009, quote, folks over the age 75 give four times as much of their income as younger folks age 25 to 44 years old. In other words, for every one member of the church who is 70 or 75 old and older, it will take four 25 to 44-year-olds to give as much as those older do. So, what's going on here? A couple other points here. One nonprofit database that tracks donations from Americans reports that if you are age 65 years old or older, they give, 65 years old or older, give 46% of all the donations given to evangelical church causes. And those age 55 to 64 give 22% of total donations. So here's the number. 55 and older give 68% or give of all charitable giving. 68%. By the way, this is based on the numbers when this was written. This was written eight years ago. So 55 is now 63. So 63 years old and older are giving 68% to the church. Now, I know for a lot of us you think, <laughs> Josh, well, okay. As young people become older, they will give more, and so there's no problem, right? <sighs> Reason number two, we need to be honest about this. Reason number two, each generation, unfortunately, gives a smaller percentage of their income to the church than the previous generation. So it's not simply that as young people get older, they become more generous. We're finding that young people, if they're stingy when they're young, they remain stingy no matter how many gray hairs, wrinkles, or no hair they have one day. That age is not the determining factor of generosity. Something else is. We'll talk about that in a moment. This is what the research shows us. He says, on the whole, their kids and grandkids of the generous generation, they do not share their commitment to evangelical ministries. Samuel Friedman, in a New York Times story about decreasing church giving, reported, a 2007 study by three professors at Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis, found that, quote, baby boomers, by the way, baby boomers, that's like my parents, baby boomers in 2000 were donating about 10% less to religious bodies than their parents, my parents' parents, did at a comparable age in 1973. So this study is showing, this is the key thing, that older folks gave when they were younger folks. And what we find out is that a 75-year-old person now who's generous 
was generous at the same level when they were 35 years old. Age does not change your commitment or your generosity. Isn't that interesting? So we're going to see giving decrease over the years because of this. Let me give you the third and final reason that we're seeing this. Giving in all generations has declined for years. So the older generation is passing away. Younger generations are not as generous. And all generations, year over year, have been giving less to the evangelical church and parachurch organizations. In fact, in fact, this is so interesting to me. Donations to many churches and ministries, quote, have plummeted 20 to 30 percent each year since the Great Recession of 2008 through 10. Dropped 20 to 30 percent every year over the past 13 years. That is a lot of decreased giving. Even pre-recession giving was decreasing. In his book, Ronald Sider says this, in 2001, members of evangelical churches gave away on average 4.27% of their income, but that was down from 6.15% of their income in 1968, though their annual household income had been rising steadily. So here's his point, he's saying, we're making more, but we're giving less. I'm making more than my peers a few years ago, and you're probably making more than your peers a few years ago, and yet as a church, as people across America, we're giving less. In fact, this rate that was once six point something, then four point something, is now on average per person, per Christian, is giving roughly about 3% of their income. And according to one study found that people who give that much, just 3%, they believe that that is sacrificial giving. Sacrificial giving. Now, The state of the church giving through 2004 said this, and if you don't hear any other stat, any other quote, listen to this one, because this summarizes the state of giving in our church. In 2004, the church reached its lowest level of giving as a percentage of income since 1961, or, here it is, listen to this, or lower than the worst years of the Great Depression. What's he saying? You and me, as very affluent people, by contrast to previous generations, we are very blessed by God. We're in a very wealthy nation. We're very blessed. And yet we are giving less today than during the Great Depression. This is the reasons why Dickerson says giving is going to be dropping over the course of the next 10 to 30 years. Now, I know, I know. Okay, some of you are saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Josh, that's horrible. That's depressing. Thank you so much. I'm glad I came to church today. But tell me, Clear Creek's not like this, correct? We are not like this. We're exempt from these trends, right? Well, let me give you some stats. Now, by the way, I don't know what any one person or family gives at church here. I don't want to know. I don't care. But I do know our statistics. Let me give you three. The first one is this. According to our most recent statistical information, 35% of people who call Clear Creek their church home do not give anything. 35%. Including those who give $100 or less, that goes up to 37%. So roughly one in three people who call Clear Creek home do not give anything to the church. And, and, in our church, we are like national trends that the oldest demographic in our church, 70 or 75 and older, give more per person than any other bracket in the church. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not complaining. We're not going to start passing the buckets. In fact, we don't do that anyway because of COVID. How many of you are thankful to God for COVID-19? Because we're not passing buckets anymore, right? So we're not asking, we're not going to do some big building campaign. That's not the point of this. It's not come give more. That's not it. That's not it. The point is simply to let you know that the way we do ministry is going to be impacted by the lack of giving. Does this make sense, church? And I want to be real clear. We made budget last year. Things are going well. We have more people coming to Clear Creek. I mean, it's just more and more. We have guests coming. Many churches have had to close their doors over the past year. We are doing great. So there is no complaint. But I want you to understand that what is happening nationally is also happening here locally. So what do we do about that? Let me give you three solutions. Write these down. Three solutions. The first one won't shock you. The second two may. The first one won't shock you because the first thing I'm going to say the solution is for us is that every person who calls on the name of Jesus, who's a Christ follower, I think we all, Josh Diggs included, needs to grow in the personal financial generosity. We need to become increasingly generous. You say, Josh, is this a big call for more money for the church? No, 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 no. This is simply saying the church, 
from the beginning has been built on generosity. Let me give you an example. The most famous Bible verse, John 3.16, football players have grease paint with it right there. John 3.16 goes like this. Join me if you know how it goes. For God so loved the, that he, what? He gave. And what did he give? His one and only he gave his son. Here's what I know. It's not like God had 12 kids and he's like, Bob, I don't like you so much. Go on down there, take care of it for me. He took his only son, his one son whom he loved, and God demonstrated the love of, that he had by giving us his first and his best. See, I often give him the last and whatever's left. But he was generous. In fact, the church took hold of this generosity so much that the Apostle Paul calls the church in Corinth to generosity. Notice what he says in 2 Corinthians. But since you excel in everything, church, he's like, you guys are awesome. By the way, church, you're awesome. I'm so glad to be a part of Clear Creek. This is a great church. You excel in so many things. He says you excel in faith, in your speech, in your knowledge, meaning you're learning, you're growing, in complete earnestness, meaning you want this as well, and in the love we have kindled in you. So you're excelling. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Grace, grace, God's gift. When God's gift has been fully received, when we really get what God has done, it will produce gratitude expressed in generosity. In other words, the more you know what God has done, the more generous you'll become. Once you know how much God has done, the more you'll give. And then the church, the church took this so, so seriously that in Acts chapter 4, we're told what happens as a result. In Acts chapter 4, all the believers were one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Now, this is not Marxism. This is not socialism. Some people say it is. No, they kept their own homes. They still had the control of what they did, but, but they lived with open hands is the point. With great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. The grace of God made manifest through the way that they give to the point that the church ran out of needy people to take care of in the church. Isn't that incredible? See, the first solution, the first solution for Josh Diggs and the first solution for you, my friends, is to simply step into greater generosity. If I am someone who's giving leftovers to the God who gave his first and his best, I want to become more like him and give my first and my best. You say, Josh, okay, so what does that mean? How much are you asking me to give? I mean, give me a percentage. I'm not going to tell you what to give. That's not my job. I will tell you that the early church considered 10% to be the starting point of generosity. In fact, they were so committed to generosity, they would give up what they had for the benefit of those around them. I love this quote from 125 AD from this Athenian philosopher turned convert. uh, Let me get the name here. Marcianus Aristides. And he says this. He's speaking of the early church. He says, if there is among them, the church, any that is poor and needy, and they, the rest of the church, excuse me, have no spare food, they fast two or three days. The early church would fast, give up eating for two or three days in order to have food which they can supply to the needy one. Friend, I have never gotten to the point in my giving that I had to give up eating to give. That's what our forebears, your and my brothers and sisters in generations past, that's generosity. Listen, I do not want to be a part of the greediest generation of the church. I want to be a part of the most generous. And I'm just telling you, and I'm calling you into this. You ask God. What I'm going to ask you is you ask God, God, am I giving as much as you would like for me to give? You ask him. Don't ask me because I don't matter. God matters. You ask him, am I giving as much as you want me to give? Because it all begins. Where does some of this change? Solution number one is to personally grow in our personal financial generosity. Number two, the second solution is this. Not only grow personally, but we've also got to find ways to make disciples that require fewer dollars. We need to find ways to make disciples that require fewer dollars. This is the one I really want you to glom onto, church, because the way that the American church has historically done ministry is dollars dependent. For instance, just look around for a moment. 
We are in a dollars-dependent ministry. Right now, there are some little ones in We Worship in beautiful facilities. By the way, I love our facilities. I hope we get to keep them forever and ever. I mean, I love this, and I hope to see other expressions of our, our church popping up around the city. I, I would love to see more people know more about Jesus. So I'm not opposed to this. But the American way of doing it is very expensive, isn't it? Because you've got to have buildings. You got to have big budgets. You got to pay guys who will come and yell at you every Sunday. I mean, come on, that's expensive. You got, not really, but you got to still do it. And you got to get worship guys and you got to get lights and you got to get AC because heaven knows when the summertime hits in Chattanooga, you need air conditioning. Can I get an oh yeah from anyone, right? So we've got to find ways to make disciples in less expensive ways. What does that mean? Let me give you a couple thoughts here. Matthew chapter 28, when the Lord Jesus himself was about to leave, he gives what is called the Great Commission. It's like saying, I'm, gonna, I'm going and I'm going to send you to go. And he's going to give them some very specific instruction. I want you to notice what he says and what he doesn't say in Matthew 28. Jesus came to them and said, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Side note, do you notice it says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit? That's why when we baptize people, we do so in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, because that's what Jesus told us to do. He says, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Quick question. In Jesus' final commission, how much of making disciples does he say is about money? Now, does that mean we don't give? Of course not. Does that mean we're not generous? Of course not. Jesus himself said, it is better to give than to receive. But Jesus understood that to make disciples did not require big buildings, big budgets, and lots of things. It required you and me simply sharing what we know as we go. He is talking to fishermen, poor guys. If it was required that they have big, multi-million dollar budgets to make disciples, you and I would not know about Jesus today. But it's because the way to make disciples does not require big budgets, big buildings, big staff. It requires something very specific and very simple. In fact, in fact, what I love is, is the church glommed onto this really, really, really well. Over the course of the first few centuries, they took this so seriously that up to a tenth of the world population by the third century knew Jesus Christ. A tenth, can you imagine? A tenth of Chattanooga knowing Jesus intimately, personally, loving him deeply. So, so a couple things happen. Let me show you this. As we make disciples differently, you say, what does that look like? Well, the early church, how did they meet? Did they meet in big buildings? Did, did they meet in big buildings? The answer is no. Everybody say no. No. No, they didn't meet in big buildings. What did they do? They gathered in these smaller disciple-making communities that met in one another's homes. In fact, in fact, a few years ago, I was in Nicaragua, and we were reaching out to the area. There's, uh, we're going to have this gathering, and people, this is in the sticks. This is not with mass transit. People are coming from five, six, seven, eight miles walking. We gathered together, and where did we gather? Did we gather in a big building? No. We gathered under a big tree. Why a big tree? Because it's hot and it created shade. So it was awesome. So 200 people come. They gather under this tree. We're gathering together in this smaller space, not indoors, outdoors, because, because, listen, listen, to fulfill the mission of Christ, it doesn't require big buildings, big budgets. It requires people simply sharing the good news of Jesus Christ as they go. Now, I think one of the places where I saw this played out beautifully was actually in the life of my, my sweet wife, Lindsay. These smaller groups, man, they change lives, and they changed my wife's life. My wife was a part of a church in Indianapolis, and her family was a part of this small group, and boy, they just loved it. And it was a great thing. It was very inexpensive because the, the home was owned by a businessman in the church. He was the leader of the small group. He had a job, so they didn't have to pay him any money to lead. Isn't that great? You didn't have to pay him. And, and they... He invited them into his home, which meant it was already paid for. They weren't paying rent for their church building, were they? And they used the Bible as their curriculum. So they didn't have to pay for the curriculum. They just opened the Bible and they shared. And yet my wife will tell you this was one of the places that changed her life. And in the moment when her family faced one of the greatest, I don't know how to say this other than for one of the greatest tri trials, when her dad left, that was her church 
And they rallied around her family and they cared for her. That was her church. That is where she found community and where everything changed. And I want to tell you, the men in that community, the women in that community were her parents and grandparents. And what she gained from that experience, she is continuing to pass on to our kids today. In other words, making disciples does not require a lot of money. It simply takes us sharing what we know as we go. Solution number three, I want to give this to you very quickly. Solution number three, We've also got to mobilize everyone to make disciples. Key phrase, not just the professionals. Not just those who have a title at a church. Not just those who are able to work full time in a church. But rather, we've got to mobilize everyone, not just the professionals. This is what we saw in the Bible, isn't it? In fact, in fact, I want you to think about this with me. The greatest missionary who ever lived the one who has done more to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ was more like you than like me. His name was Paul. In fact, Paul was was more like you than like me. In fact, we're told this very interesting little statement in Scripture. We're told that he went to a particular city and that while he was in Corinth, notice this, he was a tent maker as they were because he stayed and worked with them. In other words, Paul had a day job. He worked as a tent maker, and from being a tent maker, he had his income and then worked on the side to help plant churches and make disciples. He also later will say he doesn't want anyone to take away his right of being able to preach for free. Now listen, I'm so grateful that I get to be your preacher, that I get to do this full time. I love it. This is my favorite gig, and to be with you and to serve you, it's so much fun. But Paul, the greatest missionary in the world, was more like you than like me. He worked and he made disciples on the side. In fact, it's not just Paul and the early church that did it this way. This is what's happening around the world in church planting movements. People more like you than like me are making disciples. Three stories. The first one is of an elderly, 80-year-old Bojapuri man. By the way, show of hands. How many of you are 80 years old or younger? 80 years old or younger? Go ahead and raise your hand if you're 80 years old or younger. 80 years old or younger. Uh, We got we got some of you who are old at heart, evidently. Okay, so 80 years old or younger. He comes to faith, and then what did they tell him after this Bojapuri man comes to faith? The people who brought him to faith. What do they say? They say, okay, okay. Here's what you've got to do. You've got to now find a church building. Right? Okay. And you've got to come into this church building, and your job from now until you meet Jesus is to come and to sit. If it's a really cool church, they'll have chairs. If it's not as cool, maybe they'll have pews. You know, but you're going to sit, and then you're going to come in, and you're going to listen to a preacher yell at you for a little while, right? Because that's what everyone has to do. And when you come in, you're going to listen, and then on your drive home with your spouse, you're going to rank and rate the preacher's job, right? Because that's what we all do. We know it. Come on. Okay, and so, and then you do, is that what he was told to do? No. They said, hey, hey, did you know, did you know that you can do what we just did? You, you can make a difference in someone's life. You can make disciples. He goes, really? Yeah, yeah. So what do you do? He goes and he begins to gather his family and friends together, 80 years old. And he begins to tell them about Jesus. They read the Bible. They talk about who Jesus is. And the most incredible thing happens. In the first year of being a Christian, this 80-year-old Indian man started, hear me now, 42 churches. Wow. 42 churches in one year. Let me tell you a second story of a couple in India, a husband and wife. They're brought to faith. And again, they're not told you need to go sit in a church somewhere. You need to go listen somewhere. You need to be fed. You need to, you know, sort of, no, no, no. You go, you tell. So they begin to tell their family and their friends. And in a very short while, in fact, just in the first four years, this couple was instrumental in starting over 5,000 churches. Can you believe it? 5,000. Didn't take millions of dollars. Didn't take lots of money. It took two people who said, we got something to tell. And so they gathered their friends, they opened the Bible, and they shared. Let me give you one last one. This is of two girls, 19 and 17 years old. This is for you, students. If you're still in high school, this is you right here. They came to faith, and they became so committed to Christ and sharing the good news of Jesus that within just a few short years, the first one, the first girl, she started and helped plant 15 churches. And the second one planted 21 churches. 
before leaving high school, before graduating with a degree. See, you don't need a paycheck or to be a professional to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The mission of God is more flexible than the American way of doing things, which is really good news because if money goes down, it doesn't mean that we ever, ever have to shut the doors because the doors aren't just this building. They are your homes, your hearts, in your neighborhoods. Can you imagine what it might look like if we as a church became a bunch of church planters where we said, my home, this is my little church. In fact, tomorrow morning when we get up at well, my wife will get up very early and then we'll have breakfast as a family. Church is in session. The kids will be eating breakfast and we will begin our Bible study every morning. We have time together. You have a church in your home. And it doesn't take big budgets. It takes an open heart. What would it look like? What would it look like? And can you believe it? Can you imagine that you might be like the Apostle Paul? You could be like these brothers and sisters around the world right now. You could help start churches and make disciples. You can be a part of something so big. So here's what I'm committing to and what our leadership's committing to. Starting today and over the next number of years, as long as God allows, we're gonna be doing a better job of training you on sharing your faith. We're gonna do a better job of helping you know what it looks like to bring people into your home or into your work environment and sharing the gospel of Jesus. We're gonna help you do these things because we believe that to do what God's called us into does not require big budgets. It requires big hearts, big open hands. And so I wanna end with two challenges and we're gonna call it a morning. Challenge number one is this. Will you ask the Lord, God, am I giving as much as you want me to give? Ask him, he'll tell you. And as he does, I encourage you, I challenge you to step out in faith and be generous. And if you think that we're just after your money, don't give it here. Give it somewhere else. Give it somewhere else. But will you step into generosity as God is calling you? And then the second thing, will you ask God, say, God, where do I, who do I, how do I begin making disciples where I'm at? See, I don't need a big building. I don't need a classroom. I need an open heart and an open home, and I can make disciples just like Jesus. So those are the two challenges. Because I believe, I believe as we as a church confront these realities, God is going to do something in this church the likes of which none of us have ever imagined. You're going to see friends and family in faith. What will it look like when we get to heaven and you walk through those gates and someone comes up to you and you don't recognize them but they seem to know you because they've got a smile on their face and they're making a beeline for you. And that person says, you don't know me but you shared your faith with this group and they became a little church. And this church, they had a friend who, who, who they wanted to share faith with and they shared faith and that friend shared faith with me because you shared faith. Can you imagine the homecoming we will be a part of as we simply step into what God is calling us into? This is the great mission. Your life is much bigger. Do not waste it on sitting in a service on Sunday. Sunday should be the celebration of what God is doing throughout the week. This isn't the end point. This is simply the place where we say, yay God, as we continue to do what he's called us into.